Great. We should be live. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, um, Study in Sweden webinar about studying engineering in Sweden. Uh, my name is Douglas. I work here at the Study in Sweden team at the Swedish Institute, and I'm going to be one of your hosts for today. Hi, my name is Adam. I also work here with Douglas at the Swedish Institute. And um, we're joined by two students today who are waiting patiently from Stockholm and Gothenburg. So uh, maybe, uh, Caitlin, do you want to start off by saying hello? Yeah, so my name is Caitlin. I'm from Canada, and I'm studying medical engineering at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Great. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, and uh, Juan, do you want to say hello as well, please? Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Juan. I come from Mexico, and I'm studying uh, production engineering at Chalmers University of Technology. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Um, so uh, we'll be back to you shortly. Um, we're going to, uh, Adam and I are going to speak a little bit about some kind of basics about Sweden and um, studying in Sweden. So I'm going to start off with a, a brief presentation for all of you tuning in today. Um, and uh, I'm going to start off actually by just giving you guys, because I know we have a lot of people joining in today. Um, and we have a a number of subject area webinars. Today's webinar is about engineering. Um, we have another webinar this week on Friday about IT. And then Monday is gonna be our last subject area webinar and that's about business and economics on Monday, the 23rd of November. Uh, we do have one more webinar live stream after that. And that is on uh, Monday, the 1st of December. And so that's gonna be um, Adam and I, and then our colleagues from university admission for any of you who have questions about the admissions process. We understand you probably want to get things right and know you've sent in your application correctly. So that's your chance to ask your questions with the admission experts. And it's going to be Marlene and Ida joining us from University of Admissions. Um, so uh, the agenda for today, um, we're going to have a brief presentation, as I said, from our side, just giving you guys some basic information. Um, and then, um, Juan and Caitlin, the stars today, will let you guys talk about what it's actually like to live and study in Sweden here as an international student. Um, and then we're going to have a Q&A after your presentations. And so for all of you joining on Zoom, you can write in your questions on the Q&A um, chat there. And also, this is going live on YouTube as well. So if you have any questions and you prefer to follow us on YouTube, that's great. Um, Adam has an eye out for questions coming in on YouTube. and it's. I think we want them to send in questions anytime. Yeah, right. just whenever during the presentation. I'll try to answer some questions uh, in the chat, but I'll save some for our panelists after the presentations as well. Cool, great. Uh, so yeah, that's the structure here. Um, so around one hour in total. Um, but we're gonna start off just introducing you guys to some very basic things about Sweden and higher education here. Um, so what I'm gonna focus on in this slide is the last point there. We have 39 outstanding universities. Um, we offer over 1000 programs in English. Um, and that's something we're gonna talk about in a second here, but just so you know, we have, um, if I would compare the educational system in Sweden to the US where I'm from, in the US we have um, a lot of really great universities, but we have tons of universities and there's a huge range in quality. Um, in Sweden, I think one of the great things is that you're really guaranteed a high quality education no matter what university you go to. So you guys can be confident in basically any program uh, you find here that it's going to hold a high level of quality. Um, one other basic thing that some of you might not know yet is that English is all you need to be able to survive in Sweden, uh, both inside and outside the classroom. Um, some people are wondering, do I need to study a program in Swedish then? No, you do not because no one speaks Swedish basically other than the Swedes and um, some foreigners that I lived here for a while. But we offer, the programs we're talking about today are in English. And Swedes speak amazing English. You don't need any Swedish to survive outside the classroom. It can help, especially if you want to get a job, but you do not need to know any Swedish. Um, all right, so just some very basic things about studying in Sweden to set the stage for Juan and Caitlin. Um, all right, 
So first off, uh, you probably know our website, studyinsweden.se. We have a program database on there. Um, so uh, if you're wondering if we have a program in Sweden and in English in the, program, in the academic area you're interested in, you can search on our program database. We have every English dot program um, at all universities on there. We have over 100 bachelor programs in English. Our bachelor programs are three years long. And we have over 1,000 English taught master's programs. We have both one and two year master's programs. I think Quan and Caitlin, you guys are both studying two year programs, um, but we do have a mix of programs. At the master's level, you can study just about any subject in English. The only exceptions are medicine. We have a lot of health related programs. You just can't study to become a doctor here, a nurse. Um, you can't study dentistry and teaching. And that's just because those are professions where they are gonna be using Swedish. Um, to do that profession in Sweden. So that's why they're taught in Swedish right now. Um, some basic uh, admission details. Um, the 15th of January is the application deadline that's coming up very quickly. Don't miss that deadline. That's really important. You do have up until the 1st of February to pay the application fee, to send in supporting documents, um, but your application needs to be sent in the 15th of January. That's really important. And then you'll find out if you're admitted. Usually it's, it's early April. And the, uh, the academic year starts in late August. Um, and going back to the start of this timeline, I kind of skipped over it, but you can apply to, so you pay one application fee to apply to programs in Sweden. You can apply to four different master's programs. So those can be at different universities or the same university or mix and eight bachelor programs and the same thing for that. But you pay one application fee and you apply online through a national application portal at universityadmissions.se. Um, very briefly on scholarships, uh, the organization that Adam and I work for, the Swedish Institute, um, we have scholarships for global professionals, which, and these scholarships are for master's students from specific countries. Um, you can find a list of the countries on our website. And these scholarships are really attractive because they cover not only your entire tuition fee, but your living expenses as well. And these are only for master's students from specific countries. Um, you need to have around one and a half years of work experience, full-time work experience to be eligible for these. And the application process for these scholarships is different from the normal application process. So it's two different things. Apply to a program, apply for scholarships. Universities have scholarships as well. Um, and they will cover your tuition fee or part of your tuition fee. And all this information is available on our website as well. Um, I'm not gonna go through this in, in much detail, but this is a very rough guide to the minimum level of English language requirements, which you'll need. There's a number of different tests, tests accepted. Um, and there are exemptions as well. If you have uh, studied your bachelor's degree, for example, in a country where the language is English, you don't need to send this in. Um, but I recommend going on to our website and it's actually the University of Missions, the actual national application portal that has like all the details on a, on a country by country basis, what applies if any of you are wondering today. Um, yeah. and. Um, we do have a lot of resources available for you. Um, I'll show these later on uh, because the focus today is letting Juan and Caitlin, you guys talk and letting all of you who are listening send in your questions. So thanks for listening to us. And um, with that being said, let's pass on to Juan. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Juan Francisco Gonzalez Lopez. I come from Guanajuato, Mexico. I'm a mechanical engineer and I'm a uh, second year student in production engineering at Chalmers University of Technology. And I'm gonna talk today about my experience studying here in Sweden. So I'm gonna start talking about the classroom experience. Uh, here the academic year is divided in four study periods and each study period has two courses. Uh, something that I really like about the classroom experience here in Sweden is the amount of teamwork that you experience here. Uh, it's something that 
uh, even like in just assignments or small exercises, you, you have to work with, with people. Yeah. But the group projects are something that are more interested because interesting because you, you have uh, many different classmates from different nationalities, not only Swedish people over here. And something that is related to this classroom experience is the breaks and peak time that we have. Uh, it's normal here in Sweden to every 45 minutes have a break for coffee. And that's a great opportunity to get to know the people studying your class and also discuss the topics that you just cover in those 45 minutes of classes. And as well to focus and relax a little bit and come back fresh to another 45 minutes of lecture. And something else is the casual environment. Here, professors really like to be called by their first name. Uh, it's something that, in my opinion, really helps uh, with asking questions. So sometimes you feel more comfortable if you speak to someone uh, with the first name, more comfortable than if you have to, uh, you know, like call them by their second name. Uh, so this casual environment is something that is uh, special about here in Sweden, and it's something that I'm really enjoying so far. So my, my next slide. It's about studying production engineering here in Sweden. Uh, something that is great is, are the company visits. Here in Gothenburg is a very industrialized uh, city. Um, there are very big companies over here. And something that we have studying this uh, program, and it's something that is also for uh, similar programs, are the opportunity to visit these companies. Uh, you, you get to go there and check the real world, uh, specifically for the topic of the, of the class that you, you are being invited to the company. So this is something really, really cool about the product program. Also the guest lectures is not only going to the company, uh, experts from companies also come to the classroom and <clears throat> give guest lectures uh, for the, a specific topic. And it's something uh, also very interesting because you, they give you examples of something that happened to them in their, in their experience. So, you are not only learning about the theory, but also getting some practical elements uh, coming from experts that are doing this, this job in the real world. So that's something important from the, this program. Also the international environment, as I mentioned before, uh, I have uh, friends from many different uh, countries. So you can find people from Europe, but also from America or from Asia or well, basically everywhere in the, in the world. And also globalization, uh, it's not only um, uh, examples of companies here in Sweden, but also these companies have presence in more countries. So you also get to, to, to understand some examples of something that happens somewhere else. And it's something that uh, I, in my opinion is very valuable because uh, this is something that will continue to progress. Globalization is something that is growing uh, at a very fast pace. So having the opportunity to work with a company that also have presence somewhere else is uh, something very valuable in my opinion. Uh, my next slide, I'm gonna talk about the main difference uh, from Mexico. Uh, I would say that the main difference is the group dynamics. What I mean with this is, uh, well, you come here, you, you study, uh, usually the classes are from eight in the morning to 5 p.m. And after that, it's your time. You can go and enjoy whatever you like to do. You can go to the gym, you can go with your friends. And it's something that everyone, everyone here uh, do is like the normal. And it's also something that continue happening uh, after classes. Like uh, when I visit these companies, I realize that uh, this dynamic uh, still happens there. So that's something that I find really interesting. And this also helped planning because, well, Gothenburg is a very well connected uh, city. So the public transport is usually in time and, and you can check all the schedule in, the, in an app. So you can plan your entire day uh, based on that. You know at what time you're going to reach university, you know at what time you're going to reach your next destination. So that's something that really helps planning. And, also connected to this is the student union experience. Uh, here in Chalmers, we have um, a big student union with uh, a lot of different committees. You can find a committee for um, well, 
basically everything. I'm I'm right now part of Chalmers International Reception Committee. I'm gonna talk a little bit more in one of the next slides, but it's a very nice opportunity to also do something that is not related to the academics, but helps you to connect with people. And another point is the student ambassador. Being an international student here in Chalmers uh, brought, me, brought me the opportunity to become one, uh, one student ambassador. Here, I'm, I'm a content creator and also a unibody. So I help students uh, answering their questions in the unibody platform. And I'm also creating content uh, for the social, um, yeah, from, for the university. So this is a good opportunity that it's something that I really appreciate about Sweden as well. And this takes me to my next slides, which is uh, my degree structure. Uh, production engineering has six compulsory courses and one mandatory master thesis. Uh, other master programs follow a similar uh, structure. So. As you can see in the figure in the right, uh, that's the structure that I follow. The first study block is uh, two mandatory courses, but then you start having electives. And this takes me to the next point, which are the main occupational tracks. Uh, those are production systems, manufacturing process, and production management engineering. Uh, you don't have to follow a specific uh, track. You can pick courses from many. Right now I'm following production system and also production management engineering. So that's something that interests me and it's something that I appreciate that I can build my own degree based on what I like and what I would like to do in the future. So that's something that I also really appreciate. And this includes the practical elements. As I mentioned before, uh, we have the opportunity to uh, visit the several companies, but also the assignment and projects linked to real world. Uh, you have different group projects, different assignments. And some of them are uh, labs or seminars. And this is also another way to, to discuss this with your classmates. It's not only discussing with the professor or, or with uh, experts from industry, but you also discuss this with, with your fellow classmates. So it's, uh, you, you can have a very interesting discussions and that's how you uh, actually realize how is their perspectives. Uh, it's not the same probably for me that I come from Mexico that from someone that comes from um, Germany or India or some other country. So it's interesting to, to see the opinion of my classmates in this sense as well. So my next slide, it's about networking. Uh, one committee that is part of the student union is called CHARM. They organize a very big career fair every, every year. In that career fair, you have the opportunity to check the available positions in many companies that actually they register and they are interested in sharing all of this with, with the students in the universities. So uh, there you can find summer jobs, you can find internships, uh, master thesis projects, uh, basically all, all the opportunities that they have available at that moment. And you also uh, get their contacts. So maybe at that moment, you're not looking for anything, but it's a nice way to, to start collecting uh, some contacts that you perhaps will use in the future. So that's one point. Uh, another point is are the committees and societies. They exist uh, because of a specific purpose, but you have the opportunity to meet uh, people from many different programs there as well. Uh, that's the best part in my opinion because you never know when you are gonna do a project with someone else in a different project, in, I mean, in a different master. So for example, right now I'm looking for a thesis project with a friend that I made in, in, in Zurich in the committee. He's in another master program, but we have similar interests. So we are looking for a master thesis project together. And this was thanks to networking in the committees. And my next point is about the industry initiative to collaborate with universities. Uh, this is something that I really appreciate, as I mentioned before, because they are interested in learning from us and we're interested in learning from them. So it's a very nice collaboration going on between them. And yeah, that, that's, that's basically the opportunities that I have had to network so far. My next slide is about the social life, uh, well, social and everyday life as a student. Um, the international reception is something that happens at the beginning of the spring term or in the autumn term. Uh, here, 
it's the job of the committee to welcome all the new students and help them. So you don't need to worry that you don't have any friends over here because you, you get to be in a group with a volunteer second year student that it's the father. So you get help even before you arrive to Sweden and you also can start chatting with people. And it's uh, something that I also think is very good because going to a different country and leaving home is not uh, uh, easy, but it's also very helpful to know that there is someone waiting for you to help. So my next point is Gothenburg uh, is the second largest city here in Sweden and is uh, different from cities in Mexico, uh, I would say. There is nature everywhere. Uh, that's something that I really like. Uh, there are parks and lakes all around the city. So summer is a very nice time. You can go swim into a lake or yeah, walk, hike. And also since it's a big city, you can find all the amenities that you usually find in a big city. You can go out with friends to bars and clubs and well, all kinds of stuff. So you, you, you know that, that you can have some good social life outside the university as well. And also the sports and activities. Um, my first point over there is salsa and bachete. This is a fun fact because I came all the way to Sweden to learn bachete. Uh, I, it's something that I like. I, I used to dance a little bit of salsa before coming here, but it was nice to, to also find these kind of activities. And it's also an, a nice way to, to meet people, the local people, and have some fun like dancing with people as well. Uh, my point here is that you can find uh, activities that maybe you don't, you don't think that you will find over here. So there, there is a lot of available things. And also uh, I live in front of, of a gym. I, uh, I have a swimming pool over here. I, I, I live in a student uh, housing. That's uh, one of the points over here. Uh, students, leave, well, it's common here. Like uh, where I live, it's called uh, Chalmers Student Bostader. And it's a big complex where the, everyone here is studying at, at Chalmers or, or Gothenburg University. So you are in a student environment. So that's something cool. I have some fellow Mexican friends over here that live in the building in front of me. So we can cook together, we can talk. It's something that it's cool. I, I live 10 minutes from the university. So uh, student housing is a, another good way of uh, social and everyday life. And yep, there are very many opportunities available. So that's my experience, guys. Um, and yeah, I will answer all your questions in the Q&A session. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks, Juan. Um, super nice to hear about. Uh, you included, I think, uh, a lot of really useful aspects about student life, about your program, um, about networking and life outside the classroom as well. And we've already started getting some questions about life outside the classroom, but we'll, we'll wait to ask those until later. But the, the type of dancing you mentioned, did you say that's a type of salsa? Adam and I weren't familiar with that. We were wondering. So I have to, we have to ask you now. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, salsa and bachete. Uh, one friend from Mexico invited me to, to that. And Another fun fact is that I have met more Latin American people here in Sweden than in Mexico, and it's thanks to really. <laughs> yeah. uh, That's great. Uh, nice, cool. Um, thank you very much, Juan. We'll um, we'll now shift gears and um, come back to Stockholm, and uh, we'll pass over to uh, Caitlin to speak to you guys, and then we'll go on to the Q and A. So, Caitlin, please. Yeah, thank you. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, my name is Caitlin and I'm originally from Toronto in Canada. Uh, so this is a picture of me moving uh, with my two suitcases to Stockholm uh, like a year and a half ago now. <laughs> um, and I'm in my second year of a master's program at KTH and I'm studying medical engineering. Um, so just to give you a bit more background about uh, me before I came to Sweden, so my bachelor's degree was from the University of Toronto where I studied biomedical engineering. Um, and after finishing this, I worked for two years at a medical technology company in Toronto that made tools for neurosurgery. And I enjoyed this experience so much that I decided that I really wanted to pursue um, like education in this field and continue learning more about it. Um, so that's when I decided to come and do a master's. Um, and it was important to me to do my master's abroad because um, I really wanted to get a new perspective on a new healthcare system and a new way of developing medical innovation. 
Uh, yeah, that's that's why I thought of coming to Sweden. Um, so uh, also just a bit more background on what is medical engineering. <laughs> Um, so every time that you, for example, go to a hospital or go to get any type of medical treatment, the tools that your doctors are using are made by medical engineers. So something that I'm really interested in is tools that are for surgery. Um, so I'm excited about in my master's program, I get to explore these things in more detail. So things like surgical robotics and um, yeah, uh, coming to study at KTH, I think it's been really great because I've gotten to learn more from a technical perspective because this is an engineering school. Um, but I've also gotten to look at it from a more clinical and human factor side and take advantage of um, that you really get to shape your education and make it what you want. Um, and I also think something that I should mention about medical engineering, uh, studying it in Sweden is I was drawn also to KTH because Karolinska Hospital is so close by and you get to have clinical partnership with them. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that later in my presentation. Um, yeah, but that's just a bit of how I ended up here. <laughs> okay, so, um, so first a bit about my classroom experience uh, in the master's program. So as uh, Juan mentioned, uh, the structure of the education is a bit different than what I experienced in my bachelor's. So there, in my program, there are three semesters of courses and then one semester where you do a degree project. And each of these semesters is broken down into two periods where you take two or three different courses for seven weeks at a time. And then you have your exam and then you switch to new courses. Um, so it's really a quick turnaround in your studies and you're constantly kind of learning new things and really getting to dive deep into subjects because you only have um, two or three of them at a time, uh, which I think is a pretty great process because um, it prepares you more for what it would be like to be working at a company as well, where you're focused on one thing until it's done. So yeah, I think that's important to point out. Um, and also, uh, yeah, I mentioned that my courses have been a mix of technical and non-technical. So I have a lot of classes that have things like lab work or we are building circuits um, and prototypes. <laughs> but I've also had the opportunity to take courses in things like innovation management and future thinking. Um, and I think that it's a really unique opportunity in your master's to do that because um, and especially uh, in Sweden, because it's very easy to take elective courses at any of the universities within Stockholm, so not just at KTH. Um, so, for example, I've gone to take a course at the Stockholm School of Entrepreneurship. Um, and it's really easy to apply for these courses because we use one centralized system in Sweden to apply for your studies. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to point out that you can have a really tailored education experience and you should take advantage of getting to study exactly what you want. Um, yeah, we can go to the next one. And I can talk a bit more about um, specific courses and projects that I've worked on. Um, so uh, another thing that's, I think, similar across all engineering programs in Sweden is that your courses are very project oriented and there's a lot of teamwork. Um, so this teamwork part was not so new for me because in my bachelor's, I also did a lot of group projects. Um, but I think this is new for a lot of students and maybe is very different from what you've studied before. Um, and I think it, yeah, it gives you a lot of opportunity to learn from your peers and you really get a lot out of working on something together. You have like a collective intelligence that's more than just your own individual one. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so almost every course I did involved some kind of team project. Uh, there's usually peer review where you give feedback to other students who are working on similar projects to you. Um, and they really encourage you to work uh, with students who all have different backgrounds and bring diverse perspectives to your projects. So I think it's really nice. Uh, so yeah, these are two uh, pictures from different project courses that I've had. So the one on the left is from uh, a course that I took that was about design for accessibility. Um, and so in this course, we did some, uh, the, the main goal <laughs> of this project was to create a musical instrument for a child who has a disability. Um, and so to do this, we went on different study visits to learn about what type of requirements would be needed for this device. And then, yeah, we worked with like user experience to create this. Um, and yeah, it was a really rewarding project. Uh, we worked in teams of four. 
Um, and yeah, I, I just think that it was a really enjoyable experience and I got to learn something that was new for me. Um, and then the one on the right is from another uh, medical engineering project course that I had. And this one was about creating technology uh, that uses like signals from your body and um, yeah, different devices that can pick up signals and use them in different ways. So this is a circuit that I soldered in the lab that detects your breathing frequency. Um, yeah, and the course was really about uh, you deciding what type of sensors you wanted to uh, learn about and make and then making them in the lab. Um, so yeah, it was also a lot of fun. Uh, now we can go to the next one. Uh, so I mentioned before that uh, study visits are also a big part of my um, education. So for example, in the accessibility design course, we went to a few different organizations in Stockholm that deal with um, accessibility design and I learned about kind of the maybe unique Swedish perspective for that. Um, and then I also took another uh, really valuable course called Technology and Surgery. Um, and study visits were a big part of this course as well. Um, so we went to see Electa, which is a company that originally started in Stockholm, um, but they make radio surgery tools and now they're a huge company worldwide. Um, so that was really cool. And we heard from a few different speakers uh, when we went to visit. Um, I've also done some study visits at Karolinska Hospital. So we went to observe surgeries and speak to surgeons about what was going on. Um, and I think that that was uh, also a really unique opportunity. And as uh, Juan mentioned, there is not a very hierarchical structure in Sweden. So um, what, for example, when we were going to speak to these surgeons, it was great. We could have really good conversations with them. And we really felt that they were taking us seriously, even though we were master students and they were very busy surgeons who had so many years of experience. Um, so I think that's also something that is a big advantage to studying in Sweden is, um, yeah, this like culture of being able to ask questions and talk to people um, who are way more experienced than you. Um, yeah, I think that's all for this. <laughs> so, um, a bit more about the differences between uh, my previous experience studying in Canada and studying in Sweden. Um, so I think the biggest change for me was these short seven week periods of study for your courses. So before I was used to studying five or six subjects over an entire semester. Um, and now in Sweden, I've only studied maybe two or three at a time for seven weeks and really got to focus on them. Um, so yeah, I think this was uh, something to get used to, just that it's really fast paced. Um, but also, I like that you really get to focus on subjects. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's a good structure. Uh, and then also something that I think is just very different from studying at the bachelor level versus the master level is the flexibility in the courses that you take. So during my bachelor's, I had a very packed curriculum. And I guess anyone who's studying a bachelor's in engineering has this experience. Um, but my courses were mostly decided for me and I just had a few in the final year that I got to choose for myself. Uh, but in my master's, I've had a lot of flexibility to choose what I'm interested in, what I want to specialize on. Um, and I think this has been a great opportunity for me to really think about what I want my future career to look like and what I am really interested in. Um, yeah, and I mentioned I've also gotten to take courses yeah, at Stockholm School of Entrepreneurship and things outside of just medical engineering. So at different departments at KTH, um, like interaction design or mechanical engineering. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you to embrace this and really take advantage of it. Uh, now onto life in Sweden. Uh, so here I have some pictures of the different contrasting seasons in Sweden. Um, so I'm from Canada, so the cold and the snow and winter was not really a big deal or new for me. Um, but something that I think was really special was experiencing the Swedish summertime and the, the sunlight in the summer. Um, so the, the picture on the left on the bottom is from around midsummer time of year, um, so the end of June. And this picture was actually taken after 11 p.m. And you can see that it kind of just looks like sunset. <laughs> So these really long days in the summer, I think are something that is really special to experience. Um, and also I think another thing that's special is that you really feel so connected to nature in Sweden. Um, so no matter what time of the year it is, uh, there's so much green space that's close to your home that 
you can get outside and uh, enjoy that. So yeah, that has been a big advantage, I think, uh, or just something that I really appreciated about living in Stockholm. Um, yeah, and something else I wanted to mention that is a big part of student life in Sweden um, is sustainability. Uh, and I think a lot of people think about sustainability when they're thinking about Sweden. So this is not a big surprise. <laughs> Um, but you can really see sustainability initiatives all over campus, like there are recycling center pop-ups, there are student groups that talk about or sustainability, um, and there is also sustainable student housing projects. Uh, and just in general, there's a lot of discussion and opportunity to join initiatives and yeah, talk about sustainability. Um, and also at KTH, uh, all of the study programs, they have some um, aspect that is clearly relevant to the UN global objectives for sustainable development. Um, so for example, medical engineering, uh, it's one of these sustainable development goals is about ensuring healthy lives for people. So yeah, I just thought I would mention that this is really a big part of life here and a part of student life. So if you're interested in it, um, yeah, it's great that you can take advantage of it here. Um, and now just some so outside of school life. <laughs> Uh, so I mentioned that I really like that Sweden lets you feel close to nature. Uh, and I want to say again how special this has been for me. So when I came here, I joined the outdoor club. And um, through that, I've gotten to try some new things that have to do with the outdoors uh, and has been a lot of fun. So uh, last winter, I went on a cross-country skiing trip where we skied between mountain cabins um, and we carried all of our gear with us in backpacks. Um, so that was a really like cool and new and fun experience and also hard. <laughs> um, and then also in the summer, I've gotten to go hiking in the far north of Sweden in Sarak National Park. Um, and I've gotten to do so many weekend camping trips, even like within biking distance of where I live in Stockholm. Um, so yeah, and through this, I've met some really great friends uh, from all over the world uh, that we can hike or camp or study or have fika with. Um, yeah, so it's just been a really, uh, yeah, positive experience outside of school as well, like in the social aspects. Um, yeah, and that is all for me for now, but uh, I'm looking forward to hearing everyone's questions. Cool, thanks. So jealous of your cross-country ski trip. Yeah, I really hope I'll get to go again this year. Yeah, both of you are so uh, active outside the classroom with different activities. It's really, it's really cool. Um, yeah, so thanks. Thanks a lot, Caitlin. Um, and thank you for everyone who's been sending in questions. Adam's been working on answering them. We have a ton of questions on YouTube and on Zoom, and you can still uh, like write in your questions, either on YouTube or Zoom, and we'll try to go through all of them. Um, so let's see. Let's start here with a question from Zoom for Juan and uh, Caitlin. Uh, for students trying to decide between various engineering schools in Sweden, what drew you to your uh, this your school of choice? Um, I mean, I imagine many of us even specifically trying to decide between prioritizing Chalmers or KJH, for example, or any other of the engineering schools in Sweden. So, how did you make the decision? Um, I think a really good thing to look at is what research is going on at the school. Um, because, for example, in your master of thesis project, maybe you will be joining a research lab at the university. Um, so looking at the, the web pages of different professors research, I think, is a good way to see where there are projects happening that maybe you're really interested in. Um, and then also for me, I mentioned that uh, Karolinska Hospital is uh, based very close to KTH. And so for me, studying medical engineering, I think that that was a big draw to be so close to this clin clinical collaborator. I would say as well that uh, checking all the courses, like you can find uh, in the university pages, the description of every course and the expected uh, learning outcomes. So depending on your expectations as well, you can uh, start like looking at the electives and probably start like building a possible uh, structure plan for uh, your different options. And um, something that I would like to say is that even if you do your uh, plant structure, it can change. Like once you start getting uh, some courses here, uh, maybe you change your mind or maybe there is a course that you weren't considering that starts to be a little bit more, um, you know, like 
convincing you. So looking at the structure of the courses, the expected outcomes also help like to decide, in my opinion. Great. And we have uh, quite a lot of questions about like specific programs. Can I do this program in Sweden or at KDH or at Chalmers? And I'm not gonna go in and answer all of those questions, but rather I would recommend that you check our website, um, studyinsweden.se slash programs, because there you can search all the programs in all the universities in Sweden. And there are a ton of universities apart from KDH and Chalmers that have super interesting engineering programs and other programs. So that's all I can say on that and those types of questions, but you're really welcome to have a look on our website. And um, we have a few different questions about working um, in Sweden during your studies and after you're, you've graduated. So basically we can start with like job prospects after you graduate. Is that something you guys have been thinking about? Like, do you think you might want to uh, stay on in Sweden and look for a job? And um, I can just say also that after you graduate, uh, students get, um, the possibility to extend your residence permit for 12 months to look for a job, to do an internship, or yeah, basically to try to, to yeah, find a job. But so over to you, have you thought about this like next step? Yeah, I'm just starting to think about it. Um, also because I'm looking for my master thesis degree project right now. So I'm, I'm hoping to do that within a company. So um, yeah, the, I think those things are kind of tied together for me is this degree project and then maybe wanting to work there after. Um, but I think, yeah, it's definitely a, a possibility that I will want to stay in Stockholm. Um, there's a, quite a few like world class uh, medical device companies here, like I mentioned, Electa. Um, so yeah, I, I think that there's like a lot of opportunities um, to do really interesting and meaningful work in Sweden. Same over here. I'm also looking for a master thesis project. So what I, the topic that I am looking for is also a topic that I would like to continue working after. So I would like to stay here and especially if I can find an interesting project that I can follow up afterwards. Uh, about uh, working during, this, uh, during your studies, uh, well, it's important to consider that the master is a full-time study. So uh, some friends, what they do is uh, working in Fudora is, uh, uh, food delivery. So that's something flexible. Like if you would like to work during uh, your studies, you have to look for something flexible because uh, it's time consuming, it's full time. So it's important to consider that as well. Uh, for the ambassador, a student ambassador, uh, you get paid. Uh, but I mean, like that, that's uh, what I just said, like about the flexibility. So you cannot dedicate that many hours because you, you also need to dedicate time to, to the studies. Yeah, and I can also add that I'm also a student ambassador at KTH, and there are a few different opportunities at KTH to work part time as a student ambassador or um, to do like social media for the university. Um, so you should just keep your eyes open for those opportunities if you're interested in them. Great. Thank you, guys. Also, actually, on that note, um, you're both student ambassadors and we've had a couple of questions, people who want to get in touch with you or find you after the webinar. Could you say briefly if that's possible? I'm not sure what system you have, but if it's possible, how can stu students find you after the webinar? Uh, yes, uh, in my case, uh, if you Google uh, production engineering at Chalmers, uh, you will find the production engineering page and there you can find uh, the contact about me as well. Yeah, and it's very similar for me. So for KTH, each of the master's programs uh, that's offered here has um, an ambassador. So if you go to the webpage for that specific program and you click on students, then uh, if you go to the medical engineering one, you'll see my face. <laughs> and then you can email us directly from that uh, webpage and then we'll respond to your questions over email. Great. Um, so first off, I wanna say everyone's sending in questions. The questions are really good. Uh, excellent quality questions. Um, we've had some people wondering about uh, both fees and like living expenses. Uh, so just really briefly uh, about fees is that if any of you are a citizen of a EU or EEA country, you don't need to pay an application fee or a tuition fee. 
If you aren't a citizen of a EU or EEA country, you'll need to pay an application fee, which is around like 80, 90 euros. Um, and tuition fees, they range a little bit depending upon what you study, but an average level is gonna be around like uh, 14,000 euros um, per academic year. Um, but then as far as living expenses goes, um, well, let's start with you maybe. How would, I mean, Sweden has a reputation of being, you know, crazy expensive. Um, what's your ex experiences so far? Yeah, if, if you compare the prices from Mexico to Sweden, yeah, it's a big difference. Uh, but uh, I, this is a question that I, I also receive often. Uh, what, I, what I do is like, if you are not good at cooking, you will become good at cooking over here because it's uh, <laughs> something that you you should do to to also save some money. And uh, here, uh, I will say that also walking or having a bike also helps. The public transport is very good, but it's also not that cheap. So there is many things that you can do to save some extra extra money. Um, the rent uh, here where I am living in the student accommodation is uh, around 4,000 crowns, uh, which is like uh, 40, uh, 400 euros. Um, so yeah, it's also, uh, compared to the rest of the city, it's uh, cheaper. And it's, uh, I have all the amenities. I have the kitchen, I have a bathroom. It's a little bit small, but, but yeah, it's uh, everything that I need so far. So yeah, it's, it's expensive, but you can, you can manage. And, the good point is uh, the, the right side that you, you will also improve your good risk. That's, yeah, that's very true. Uh, maybe you can't guarantee you'll become a good cook, but <laughs> everyone will improve. Yeah, I can also add that I have cooked way more here than ever before. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, Caitlin, what are your thoughts on uh, living expenses um, compared to, I guess, Toronto yeah. or Canada? Um, I think that Stockholm is a bit more expensive than, than Canada, but Toronto is also a big city and is not that cheap. <laughs> so I think that, uh, of course, I've had to like think about budget here and think about cooking at home versus eating out and yeah, buying things secondhand. Um, but it's been pretty manageable. Um, so I think that there's a lot of opportunities to buy things um, like used in Sweden if you want to save money. So for example, you can get a bike for not very expensive and then you have a free way to get around. <laughs> um, also, like a lot of the activities that I really like to do, like camping and hiking, it's totally free to do that in Sweden. Um, yeah, you have like the right of public access here. So you're permitted to go hike and camp on public land. Um, so yeah, that has been like, a great way for me to do something that I really love and I don't have to pay any money to do that. Um, and also I just wanted to add about the housing that I actually think that is a great thing about, uh, I, I guess it's similar all over Sweden, but in Stockholm we have like a student housing um, association, I guess called SSSB and uh, how it works is you get into a queue and then they provide really affordable student apartments that are pretty high quality. Um, and so, yeah, just if you want to have affordable housing, you really need to join the housing queue as soon as possible. Um, but I think that that is something that's kind of unique to, to Sweden, um, because, for example, in Toronto, there's no like affordable housing for students. You just have to pay a lot. <laughs> um, so whereas the system in Sweden, you like, you know how it works, you join the queue and then you wait your turn and then you get a really nice apartment for not very much money. So. Thanks for bringing up housing because we've, we've had questions about accommodation as well. Um, and it, it obviously varies quite a bit on the university and what their policy is and like cities as well. But Juan, what's, um, what's your experience? I mean, you mentioned the place you're living in now, but are students uh, provided accommodation at Chalmers or how does that work? Uh, yeah, well, uh, as you mentioned, the people that come from EU, they don't pay tuition fees, so they have to join the queues and look for accommodation on their own. But if you're an international student, you, you get help from, from Chalmers. Uh, there are two big uh, student accommodations here in, in Gothenburg. One is uh, Chalmers Student Bostader, where I live, and the other one is SGS. Uh, both of them uh, follow a, a similar system, as Caitlin mentioned. You have to join a queue and after you accumulate a certain amount of points, you can start applying for different different uh, apartments. Uh, yep. Great, thanks guys. Um, really good input on living, living expenses as well, and good tips with bikes and 
public transport and cooking very true. Yeah. So we had a couple of questions on YouTube and Zoom um, about the current situation. And um, so I'm not sure you you both I think studied before the Corona pandemic as well. At least one, yeah, you two, Adrian. So maybe you can compare a bit. Like, what is the situ situation like now in terms of online, offline teaching? Yeah, what does it look like for you? Well, from from my side, I I think it's. Uh... The, the quality is, is, is the same. Like I, I enjoy being, having classes in Zoom. Like what I miss sometimes is the social interaction. Like I, I guess this happens everywhere, like not only here in, in Sweden. Uh, these uh, breaks that I mentioned, the FICA time and these small amounts of, of time that you get in between the lectures is something that I particularly miss because it's, uh, well, you, you get to chat with your classmates and have, have a coffee. And I mean, like here in my room, I have my coffee maker over here. So it's free coffee. I, I, I'm saving some money there as well. But, but yeah, I, I miss those small interactions. Um, also, well, since we are living in a student accommodation right now, I, I have uh, friends living just next door, basically. So sometimes we meet and cook together or we go for a walk. Uh, having nature everywhere also, also helps because you can just walk uh, 10 minutes and you're in a park, uh, basically anywhere you live in the city. So that also helps. But, but yeah, I, I'm actually personally doing some meditation uh, that, that helps like sometimes being far away from the, your family, you, you start like having yeah. thoughts, like, oh, are they okay? I'm so far away, but I mean, like we just need to uh, be, be calm and continue doing what, what we are doing here. So yeah, that's my experience. Yeah, I can also add about just, uh, yeah, maybe more on a practical side of what our education has looked like. So um, this fall, I've had a mix of online and small groups in person education. Uh, so all of the lectures that I've had have been over Zoom. Um, but then I'm still able to go to the university to do lab work, uh, like in small groups or just on my own. Um, so yeah, I think that has been a pretty good compromise of making sure that we still got to do the hands-on part of our studies. Um, yeah, and then, I mean, as far as social life uh, and like outside of the classroom, yeah, we have had to follow the recommendations or like the, the yeah, regulations here. Um, so earlier in the fall, I was meeting up um, with the outdoor club with small groups of students to do like hiking trips, uh, but now we're not doing physical events. So we're adapting and trying to do some online things that are still like outdoor themed. <laughs> so um, next week we're gonna have like a storytelling event where people can come and just talk about a really cool trip that they've had before and hopefully feel like inspired and get to meet some new people that virtually. I, I, I would like to add now that you mentioned that Gitlin, I, I'm doing a course right now called Industry Project and that's a course with a company. Uh, since we have these restrictions, we are doing everything digitally, but uh, that, that's something that I feel is nice about this whole change in, well, because of the pandemic, because all the companies are moving into a more digital way of working as well. So we are about to plan some interviews with the staff that are not here in Sweden, it's the staff that are in um, other countries. But this situation helped us to, to make it easy to have the interviews as well. So um, yeah, it's uh, even if you have like a practical course, you continue doing um, like what you will do. So yeah. Let's see here. We've had a couple of questions about um, going from a background, say a bachelor's degree, in uh, one area and then switching over to do something different. So go from social science to a natural science degree. Or for example, we have one who wants to go from a undergrad in liberal arts, uh, concentration on science to a medical engineering degree in Sweden. I don't know if you guys know sort of for your program specifically and in general, I know there are a lot of programs that don't require us like a strict, that you have to have studied something to go on to study the same, but yeah, do you guys know? Yeah, um, for medical engineering, it's actually quite common that your bachelor's was not in medical engineering. Um, 
there's a lot of people that come from like a mechanical or electrical engineering or software. Um, but I think for my program, it is a requirement that you have an engineering degree for your bachelor's, um, but you should just check the requirements yourself on the website. It's really clear about what you need. Um, and if you don't have an engineering degree, I think you can still um, justify that you've taken enough engineering courses. So it even says like, you need to have taken this many credits in computer science and this many credits in math, and then you'll be fine. Um, but yeah, you definitely don't need to have studied um, medical engineering or biomedical engineering before. Um, and also I mentioned that the, the courses you take is quite flexible. So I think if you were someone who was like new to medical engineering, it's totally fine because you could just choose to take some courses that would like get you more up to speed on things like anatomy. <laughs> um, and yeah, if you have studied it before, then you would just like choose different things. So I think that there is quite a bit of flexibility. And if you're really interested and motivated, then you will be able to make it work, no problem. Yeah, Kidlin basically covered everything. Uh, what I will say is like to <laughs> check the, per the, requ uh, the prerequisites very, very carefully because some, some courses you actually have to need uh, some background in some of the topics because some professors uh, assume that everyone there already knows that. So even if you have the, the prerequisites, you should check the course. So uh, that's another advantage. You have all the um, content already online. So you can uh, check which courses you probably need to study a little bit more before taking them or, yeah. But if you uh, meet the, the prerequisites, yeah, you can, you can apply even if it is not exactly your area. Yeah, also I could add one more thing that you reminded me. <laughs> um, so about the like, just checking the prerequisites yourself to understand if you would be able to take a course. Um, this is something that I did when I took a CAD course uh, last spring. So because I didn't have a mechanical engineering background, I was not sure if I would be able to take this course, but I also really wanted to learn SOLIDWORKS. Um, so yeah, I think it was really useful to be able to go through and see exactly what like the learning outcomes of the course would be. And then I was able to just like do some introductory SOLIDWORKS like learning myself from YouTube. <laughs> and then it was fine for me to take the course. Um, and I also talked to the professor just about if she thought this strategy would work for me and she was fine with it. So yeah, I would say uh, it, it's great to like read that information and take advantage of it. Great, thanks. Cool. So we have a lot of questions about uh, scholarships and the scholarships for specific countries and specific programs. And we're not going to go into the specifics about this in this webinar. But uh, in general, I would recommend to check our website because then they'll show you exactly which scholarships are available for your country. Uh, so that's uh, studyinsweden.se dash um, scholarships. And uh, yeah, basically some, someone asked if you can apply for several scholarships. Yes, you can apply for several. That's totally, it's probably a good idea because you never know which ones you're gonna get and there's a lot of competition. Um, but yeah, it's, it differs for, all, for different programs and for different countries of background. So you really need to check our website and also check the website of your university. Um, I don't know if you guys want to um, add anything. Have you applied for scholarships for your programs? Uh, yeah, I have a, a KTH scholarship that covers my tuition fees, um, and I just applied for it kind of in parallel to when I was applying to study at KTH. Um, so I would definitely recommend that if you are interested in studying at KTH, all the information about the KTH uh, scholarships is on the website. Um, and there was no country requirements for the KTH scholarship. Um, so yeah, you should look into it. I think it's a really great opportunity. Yeah, in my case, I also have a 75% reduction fee, uh, the scholarship that covers uh, that. Uh, it's the same. You can find all the available scholarships in the uh, Chalmers portal. And another recommendation that I, I would say is like check if your country has a scholarship available for for the your well the citizens. Uh, Mexico, for instance, have uh, some some scholarships that, that you can apply that covers well help you a little bit with the expenses. So not only look for scholarships here in, in the universities and in Sweden, but also check the available options that you have in your own countries. That's a great advice, yeah. And um, 
a completely different question. Uh, let's see. Like, what are the looking at the students in your programs? What's the age difference? We have had some questions whether you can apply uh, if you are an older student, and yeah, totally, there is no age limits to applying. But what are the kind of the the mix in your classrooms? Is it is everyone sort of the same age, or is there a difference? Well, I will think that in my experience, uh, most of us are around the same age. Uh, but also, there are exchange students or Erasmus students that might be younger. So that, that was my, my experience as well. I, I came here to Chalmers four years ago as an exchange, and I was 21 years old. So you, you can ex expect, like, a, I would say, four years difference, plus minus sometimes. Yeah, I guess similar for me. I mean, I don't know the exact ages of everyone in my program, but uh, like I, for example, worked for two years in between my bachelor's and my master's and also bachelor programs in Canada are longer than in Europe. So, um, but yeah, I would say like everyone is, well, not everyone, but many people are like in their twenties somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. And it's quite common as a Swedish student to sort of uh, wait a while before you start, like start your um, degree in Sweden and kind of work for a few years. So I'd say, yeah, there probably is a bit of a mix, but maybe slightly towards slightly younger 20s, early 30s. Great. Um, we have a question here from a student who's wondering if it's OK to apply for a master's before they've graduated. And the answer to that is yes. It's totally okay to apply for a master's program in Sweden if you haven't yet graduated, assuming you're going to be graduating later on in the spring or June or something like that, for example. Um, however, to be accepted to a bachelor's program, you do have to have uh, graduated from high school or secondary school or equivalent before you are accepted. So that's a little different. But for the master's level, you can apply if you haven't yet graduated, but you're going to graduate. Great. So we have so many good questions, and I'm afraid we won't have time for all of them. But uh, if it's okay with you guys, we'll take just a few more questions. Great. So we have one here about uh, healthcare and um, whether it's available for international students. Um, are there university doctors or public hospitals, or uh, is it is an appointment is it an appointment system, and are expenses covered by student insurance at the university? Basically, how does it work, healthcare as an international student? Uh, so if you're coming for a two-year master's program, then you can sign up or you can register uh, in Sweden to get a personal number. Um, and I would highly recommend you do this because then when you have your personal number, you just get the same healthcare as everyone else in Sweden. Um, there's a really centralized system in Sweden where um, you can like book appointments online or you can call a national number to get healthcare advice or to book an appointment. Um, so if you set up your personal number, it's really easy to get healthcare. <laughs> uh, so just if that is an option for you, I would highly recommend that you do it. Um, and yeah, I don't know, Juan, you can add. <laughs> yeah, like for uh, exchange students or, or programs that are not two years, like less than one year, uh, yeah, you need to, to get, a, a, well, insurance from your own country that covers internationally. So, but, but yeah, if you, if you are coming for, <clears throat> for more than one year, you apply for the um, personal number and it's, uh, as Caitlin said, yep. Great. And yeah, so like Caitlin said, uh, healthcare is available and you're sort of get the same um, the same benefits as a Swedish student and they're like very low cost sort of um, healthcare. Yeah. yeah, that's a great setup for sure. Let's see, what else do we have? We have so many questions. And like I said before, early on in the presentation, we have a lot of application specific questions. And for those questions, I think it's best to um, join us for our application webinar, which is on December 1st. There will be a link sent out to everyone uh, who participated on Zoom tomorrow. You can register for the webinar. And on YouTube, in the description of the video, there's a link where you can sign up for that webinar as well. So save all those questions, and we'll try to answer them on the December 1st. Uh, how do, do you have any more questions? Um, no, I think we can um, wrap up. Uh, so 
uh, thanks a ton for Caitlin and Juan for taking part. Uh, really nice presentations and for answering the questions so so openly and for your time on a Wednesday evening, or I guess wherever the viewers are uh, tuning in from um, right now. Um, Juan, Caitlin, would you like to add anything before we wrap up? Uh, I don't think so. I think we covered a lot of really great stuff and just don't be shy to reach out to the student ambassadors at the different schools if you have more questions. We're happy to email you back. Great, thanks. And so again, you can find Caitlin and Juan on the um, uh, student ambassador websites on KTH and Chalmers websites, right? Yes. So do, you, do you have anything you want to add, Juan, when we're wrapping up here? Uh, no, just that, like, as Caitlin said, like, if you have any other question or something comes up and you want to ask, uh, you can find us there. And also there are many students that if you're looking for a specific question on another program, they will be happy to help. Great. Great. And um, other questions we didn't have time to answer. Um, for general questions, you can go to our uh, Facebook page, which is uh, search for study in Sweden or facebook.com slash study in Sweden. And there are uh, digital ambassadors who can help you answer questions in the comments there. And um, we definitely recommend if you haven't checking out us, checking us out on uh, social media as well. You can see on this um, slide here um, our YouTube um, and our Instagram, and both of those are um, have a lot of content created by our own digital ambassadors. And you can ask them questions as well. Um, our digital ambassadors write blog posts as well on blogs.studyinsweden.se. And then, as Adam said, if you want to ask our team questions, you can do so on Facebook. Um, but yeah, with that being said, uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, we, we hope that all of you are safe and um, potentially see you at, at, I guess, on the 1st of December as well with University of Visions.